And for our presentation tonight, um, the Graduate School of Management is uh, really all about turning ideas into action um, or turning theory into practice uh, and taking knowledge from the classroom and and turning it into practical applications in the world. And, and this is true about everything we do uh, at the GSM, but one of the ways in which we do that is by bringing people uh, from, uh, to the campus from business who, who through their corporate experience offer insight into real world problems and issues that we think about and talk about and develop skills in uh, on campus. It took us two years, but, uh, <laughs> but through the efforts of our friend and alum, um, and GSM alum, Scott, um, Scott uh, Scaramastro, we've, ex we've succeeded in uh, bringing to our community Bill Sullivan um, to, this to this campus. And I really want to thank Scott for, for being such a good alum and, uh, and making this opportunity possible for us. And I also want to thank uh, Barbara Celli. Barbara is the Campus Director of Corporate Relations and Scott Allen, who's the Director of Development in uh, College of Engineering, uh, for their guidance in helping us structure this day. So thank you to all of you. And now to introduce our uh, very distinguished uh, presenter and our guest of honor, uh, Bill Sullivan. Uh, Bill, like many of the people in this room, is a UC Davis Aggie. He is an alum, and uh, we are very happy to welcome him back to campus. And he says that the campus looks a little different when uh, he was an undergraduate here. Uh, we are very proud of his accomplishments and pleased that he agreed to, to come uh, to the campus uh, this evening to, to visit his alma mater and talk to us tonight. In March 2005, Bill was named President and Chief Executive Officer of Agilent Technologies. Agilent is the world's premier measurement company and the technology leader in innovation, innovative solutions for communications, and electronics, uh, life sciences, and chemical analysis. This is a company that has 28,000 employees. It has a global presence um, with customers in uh, 110 companies. It's a very large and important uh, corporation. Bill uh, joined Hewlett Packard in 1976, uh, and during the course of his career, he, he developed um, considerable expertise in telecommunications, in data communications, and computers. And in 1999, when Agilent uh, was spun off from Hewlett Packard, he was named to the top post of Agilent Semiconductor Products Group before be becoming appointed the Chief Operating Officer, and then later President and CEO. As president and CEO, Bill focuses on operations, their improvement, management processes, and short-term strategic and tactical issues. He has overall responsibility for Agilent's electronic products and solutions group, the company's largest business group. Uh, this summer, in August 2005, Sullivan cemented his reputation as a decisive and uh, tough-minded decision maker. He's had, to, he's had to make some really, really tough calls. He led Agilent in the sale of its semiconductor unit, uh, it, which is its second largest business to private investors, for $2.66 billion. Um, cut 1,300 jobs, I know that was a tough one, and sold Agilent stake in LumaLeds, the world's largest producer of high-power light-emitting diodes, to its partner, Royal Phillips Electronics, for $950 million. These moves are bringing Agilent closer to Bill's stated goal of having an operating profit margin of 15%, and it's also allowed Agilent to go back to its roots as a, as a pure play scientific uh, testing uh, equipment maker. I'm very honored to have Bill join us tonight. His talk's entitled, Innovation in a Changing uh, Global Tech Industry. So please join me in welcoming Bill Sullivan. Well, thank you uh, very much. I can't tell you what an honor and a privilege it is for me to speak 
to you today and uh, just having a great afternoon here on Davis. Uh, it has been many years since I have been here. Um, I told everybody that I would never have been able to find my way home on my bicycle if I was dropped off where I am standing today. Uh, it has changed dramatically over these years and you should all be very proud that UC Davis considered a premier university not only in California, not only in the US, but in the world. So I am very honored to be here. You know, and I was thinking about coming back, and it has been so many years, what, you know, what, what was going through my mind? And I have to share with you that years that I spent in Davis, I can remember vividly as if they were here yesterday. And there are two things that stick with my mind. One was, of course, the education part. Building, to be able to build a foundation for a lifetime of learning. Uh, you know, I was here, and you always think about what you remember after so many years when I started here in 1968, but it was that foundation foundation of learning that I've been able to go on and learn electronics, uh, to go to executive uh, MBA programs, and now in my new job I have to learn all about the world of bioscience. And I'll tell you a secret, when I took chemistry here I did not like it. <laughs> and all of a sudden now I have to help be able to make these decisions about bioscience and how do you get that domain knowledge. And so if you go home and you can ask my wife, I have stacks of books on molecular biology, how do mass specs work, they're all sitting next to my reading chair as I continue my my uh, lifetime of uh, learning. The second thing that I remember is the friendships that I had built. And uh, I can tell you, uh, two months ago, I met with seven other colleagues I went to school with over that period of time. We played golf outside of Shasta. And uh, it was like we had just gone back to school. Our behavior immediately returned to how it was living in a dorm. <laughs> it was a good thing none of our wives were invited, so we were uh, having a good time. But it was this friendship and the number of people that I've been able to keep in contact after all these years has been, is really outstanding. And from that, that built the foundation for my career. And again, today, yes, I'm CEO, but it has been an adventure. Uh, when I left Davis, I uh, traveled around the world. I actually fixed slot machines for Bill Hare when he was still alive, running Hare's up at Tahoe so I could go skiing, uh, going to Ireland. I just had a great time. And Hewlett Packard hired me uh, while I went back to school to take electronics to work on the weekend to grow what was called gallium arsenide crystals. And what those are is the substrates to make light emitting diodes that went into the HP 35 calculator. I know all of you in this room are way too young to ever remember the original HP 35 calculator, but that's how I got started. And uh, so I worked there and I can remember the day they said, uh, Bill, you know, you finished school, do you want a full-time job? And I said, sure, I'd like it. And he said, well, we're going to give you a raise from $605 a month to $635 a month. And um, it was like, that was very good. And it was probably the most memorable uh, experience that I had is because when I came and I met my girlfriend at the time, and again, uh, is still my girlfriend, and she says, great, you have a real job, now you can marry me. So uh, that was, I can thank to HP. So from then, as well as had enormous opportunity working in research and development for 10 to 15 years, had an opportunity to uh, work in Singapore for three years to run that operation, and it really has been a lifetime of learning. And being in a business and running a business, it really is, as you all know, about creating value. And underlying that is creation value through innovation. And what I'd like to share with you today is a little bit about the value creation decisions that we made in Agilent uh, as of August 15th. From that position, the paramount need, the absolute outcome is to create an envir environment of innovation to be able to compete in a global economy that is not easy. Many of you that will go into industry have been in industry. I had it easy for the last 30 years because the electronics industry grew at a compounded growth rate of 10% and there are pluses and minuses. It was all and up and to the right. But the technology industry is changing. Fortunately, the biotech is replacing it. Much of the technology from the electronic side I think can be leveraged at the biotech and of course that's what Agilent's all about. But the world is much different and for our ability to compete, it really is about innovation. So just briefly, in terms of uh, Agilent, and uh, again, you know, we were part of HP. In fact, when Yule and Packard started, they started on the instrumentation side. So in many ways, many of us inside of Agilent look at ourselves as the original Yule and Packard that happened to get into the computer business. Now, that's an $80 billion right now here, but that, that was where we had started. And when we separated from Yule and Packard, it was euphoria. It was the dot-com boom. Business was booming. Our business was growing 40 or 50 percent. We hired 15,000 people from 1999 to the year 2000. And as you know, what happened is 
is that the telecom bus came. And uh, I always joke, and I do this particularly when I'm in Europe and in Asia, I say, do you remember the Americans used to say that this is the new economy, that you can grow forever and not make any money and your stock price keeps going up? And uh, but, you know, that was, the, that was the cowboy mentality of lack of anything. And of course, it came down. And we as a company, and of course, in Silicon Valley, and much of the industry has gone through enormous restructuring over that period of time. We've had to do that too. We've had massive layoffs. We've reduced our footprint in the world by five million square feet. And so it has been a, a difficult time to refocus the company moving forward. When I became CEO and again continually working with the board and continue the work that Ned Barnhold, the CEO and my predecessor, was looking at a company and where do you create sustainable value in this new world, this new global world. I'm going to talk more about this. And so we made the decision that we would focus on what we do the best and that is measurement. We do the world's best job of measuring photons, electrons, uh, organic, inorganic material. And so we made the decision to separate our semiconductor related business, set them up as successful new companies, and then take that money, again, the four and a half billion dollars, or three and a half billion dollars, that, or it's four and a half billion dollars that we have, and immediately return it to the shareholders via a stock repurchase. And as you can imagine, that just creates enormous uh, value. Every one of you that's in the, uh, uh, the program here knows uh, double your profits, reduce your share count, your earnings per share go up, if the multiple stays the same, your stock price goes up. And of course, that's, uh, that's what happened. The reason that we focused on this measurement market is I believe given our position, again we're the largest in this market, two and a half times bigger than any of our competitors, that it's a $40 billion opportunity, $20 billion on electronic measurement, $20 billion on the bioanalytical with unique opportunities to take that technology, leverage it into nanotechnology fields, into homeland security. We believe we are uniquely positioned and have told Wall Street and we've told our employees that we are going to outgrow the market. This type of market, and again, no matter what you look in the past, the overall industry is slowing down and is growing the seven to eight percent range, both on the uh, life science as well as on the uh, uh, the electronic side and having that growth and to be able to do that is all about differentiating ourselves and creating value as we do that. We start, as I mentioned, from a very, very strong position. As you can see, and again, not to, to brag about our market position, but we're clearly number one in many of the segments of measurement. So when you think of Olympics, drug testing, you can think of Agilent. When you think of drug discovery, drug QA in the big pharmaceutical companies, you can think of Agilent. When you think of food testing, environmental testing, petrochemical testing, when you think of testing 70% of the cell phones in the world, when you think of an air, when a jet lands on an aircraft carrier uh, and the electronic diagnostics is done, those are the things that Agilent does. The broad breadth of products to be there, to be that partner for the engineers, scientists, the service providers in the world. We actually monitor 70% of your cell phone calls around the world to manage the systems to ensure that when there's not a connection, you know what's going on. So that is what Agilent is about. That is our opportunity moving forward to be able to make created value. And so as a result of that, focusing on our core markets, and again, uh, and you can debate this, and you debate this in your class, is a diversified co company better off than a focused company? I believe a focused company is the way to go. There are very, very few hist examples in history of diversified companies having sustainable value greater than any sort of index mean. Realign the cost structure I talked about, we are obviously going to dramatically increase our earnings power, which immediately drives into shareholder value. But in a lot of ways, what we have done short term is a financial engineering by focusing and moving forward. Ultimately, the ability of Agilent or the ability of any company to win, it is all about sustained ability to compete in this global environment. So I'm going to share with you some of my thoughts. And what you're going to see over the next few slides are Bill Sullivan's thoughts, right? And uh, some of you can validate my opinion. I can, and uh, it's just through, ex uh, uh, through experience, have not done uh, the absolute, uh, uh, all the data to verify my suppositions. But first of all, I talked about the telecom boom and bust of 2000. 
the technology industry is slowing and it is converting to a consumer base. Big, big deal. If you go back and look at our business in the year 2000, particularly in the semiconductor area, 50% of our business went into consumer products, 50% went into enterprise. As you know, digging up the streets, putting in fiber optics, putting switches, putting high bandwidth links inside a building such as this was what I call the enterprise. And today, that shift has been dramatic to the consumer. And as you know, a consumer market is not for the faint of heart. Uh, there is enormous volatility. There is enormous wind of about what is good today. I don't think it's as bad as the toy business, which will be quite interesting when you talk to Mattel, to try to guess what a six-year-old child is going to be excited about. But uh, it is not for the faint of heart. But the big issue that I would uh, submit to you is that the emergence of China in India is the biggest economic disruption in 65 years since World War II. This is just a big, big deal. You know, I leave again for China again this Saturday. I've been to China and India four or five times already this year. Uh, and what is happening is incredibly powerful, incredibly good for the people in India and China, but enormous pressure on the West. What you are seeing are billions of people, obviously well-educated, with capital, and with economic freedom, and they are creating wealth at an astronomical rate. And so the result of that, of course, is it immediately puts pressure on the standard of living in the U.S., in Europe, and Japan. And I give this talk, and everywhere I travel, when I travel into the U.S., I talked about it this morning when we visited the employees in Agilent that are up in Roseville, and we as a country, we as a company, have some choices. The first one is to deny this is happening. If I gave this talk two or three years ago, you'd probably hear, oh, that's not going to happen. They're not any good. They can't learn. They can't come up the learning curve. And uh, my guess is none of you believe that anymore. In terms of Agilent today, there are nine Chinese test and measurement companies that want to kill us. Right? I mean, why, if Agilent's the biggest, what do they have a business model to win? Fortunately, we just recently bought one of them. Uh, so now there's only eight test and measurement companies that want to kill us. Uh, and again, I was there, we bought a company in Chengdu. And uh, again, incredibly, because we're going to protect our flanks, we're going to go into the low end instrumentation and have a business model that will compete with a different business model, not the traditional business model that has been in HP and Agilent for 65 years, high end, lots of uh, bells and whistles to really to be able to position to do that. The second, of course, is to ask your governments to regulate. Right? We'll just pass the best laws. This will go along. How many of you in here uh, own uh, non-Ford GM Chrysler cars? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a great strategy of Detroit, right, in the 80s? <laughs> great strategy. And when I look at that, and obviously the answer, and you all know this, it is all about innovation. And again, for myself, at 25 years in the semiconductor industry, you know, Japan was going to put the U.S. semiconductor industry out of business. They got together, they reinvented themselves, and in fact, were able to compete. But if I keep on with the analogy of the automobiles, what's the most profitable automobile company in the world? Does anyone know? Toyota. No. It's Porsche. It's Porsche is the most, it is. Guess what? It's a German car. Germans actually spend more money than you know, we do. Why is that? And I, I must say, I, I'll, I'll share with you, I do drive a, a Porsche, which is so I'm somewhat <laughs> but, but the uh, uh, the BMWs, obviously the Toyota story is moving forward. It is about differentiation in that. And, uh, and I'll share a story. I was giving a talk, and I was giving this talk into Colorado Springs. And again, we have a huge uh, development center, IT center. And one of the employees asked me, and they said, Bill, uh, what are you going to tell all the software people inside of this building that are doing a job that can be done at one-seventh the cost in India? And I said, if you're still going to do that job, you're going to lose. You can't do the same job. You can't look back. You've got to look in the forward. And how do we as a country, how do we as a company redefine the marketplaces, reinvest in areas so that we can differentiate ourselves? That is what it's all about, is about innovation and innovation inside of Agilent and, of course, the innovation history that we've, you know, we've had from our legacy in HP. So 
when I talk about innovation, uh, we always talk about products and technology, and that's what you read in the paper. But I want to make sure that, and again, the example I use, products are easy to describe. But innovation is far broader, as you know, than just products and technology. It is the business model. It is the management processes. You know, the Gary Hamels of the world will talk about that the real innovation is in the, uh, the business. You know, the Henry Chesbros of talking about open innovation, they're just, it's a broad way. Everybody knows that Dell does a great job. Everybody knows what Dell does. Nobody can beat them, right? I mean, when you think about it, you think HP doesn't know what Dell does? And, uh, and, I, and I'll give an example about innovation. That's why it's not product. And uh, again, geez, it is unfair that Dell only spends six-tenths of 1% on research and development. That's unfair. I'm spending 5%. To compete, I'm innovating. They're only spending 0.6, but they make all the money and they're growing faster. One could flip the question around, is Dell the most innovative PC company in the world because they are killing everybody by only spending 0.6% on R&D, right? And so this whole, this whole environment of looking at innovation has, is far broader. And that's why I was so interested listening today, uh, the programs that you're doing, and again, the Big Bang, to be able to get people together, to get a common language, some multiple disciplines to allow that innovation to go, I thought was just a great idea and a great example that you know just stuck in my head as I went through the presentations uh, earlier uh, in the afternoon. So it really is about everything that we do. So from my perspective, what are the differentiators? And again, this is Sullivan's two cents for what it is. But it is about the people, the culture, and the ability to commercialize. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. For, to me, that's my simple recipe. And it starts with the people. First of all, it's the people who do the work. It's the engineers, it's the scientists, it's the technicians, the people on the shop floor. You gotta have the best people. There's just no doubt about it. You need smart people, you need well-trained people, you need people that know their stuff. I think that there's a period of time where people talked about soft skills. Oh, God, great team player, great, great. I mean, it's important, you gotta get along with people. But it is about people who know their stuff. There has been a lot of work done, and we do that inside of the culture of ourselves that tends to be consensus driven, is that 80% of results are driven by people through content. 20% is some of the softer skills. It is about knowing your stuff. The second part is about the leadership, and those are the people part, right? Somebody has to lead this team. And I'll share with you a study that was done under Hewlett Packard, and it stuck in my head. And again, I was in R&D for well over 10 years. And HP at that time did a study of companies of how, what, was, what was unique about innovation. I mean, the people back in the days of Sony, uh, when Sony led the world in terms of technology leadership, as you remember, and companies go through these phases. You know, was there some process, or was there something magical that happened that allowed companies to be innovative? And the only thing they could find that was consistent in Japan, the US, or Europe at the time of this study was done is that, guess what? Management put the best people on the task. That was the omen common feeling. What do best people mean? Well, somebody, the marketeer, the R&D person, who had the knack, had the content knowledge, right? I talked about the content knowledge, had the knack to look at a customer experience, to look at the future and think of a way to differentiate itself. And it's a knack to do that. And some people see that really well, and some people have real difficulty doing that. And it's not a hierarchical uh, organization. All these organization charts where you have an R&D manager, and then you have a section manager, and I got a project leader, and so the only management ever sees the idea has been filtered through three layers. The best companies never did that. They made sure that the people that were touching the market, touching the customers, they're the ones that got the, the view. They're the ones that uh, you, you talk to. And uh, I'll never forget that. And so when I became an R&D manager, and any time I have ever taken on a new job, I always head out on the road to talk to the thought leaders inside of the industry. And it's typically not somebody like myself who's a CEO who's got a bunch of color slides. It is about some guy in some corner that has the vision of where things are going and the ideas moving forward. And, and, and I'll close on this, in this part is that if you read something in a magazine and think that that's marketing or innovation because somebody wrote a magazine, you are already dead because it's already gone, right? Somebody has thought years before that of this whole process of what's going on. So it's about the people and it's about the leadership 
to be able to create that vision and to be able to build the capability to get the results. All of that has to happen in an environment that encourages and supports that activity. And I think this is something that has been unique inside of the U.S., has been unique in a lot of, in some other cultures, but particularly in the U.S., of creating that environment where the people that I'm talking about, and again, they may be hard to manage. As you know, I'm sure you have some colleagues, they're brilliant, but sometimes they can be a little bit off the wall, or they like to come to work at 10 o'clock at night, and oh, we gotta be at work at eight o'clock. Oh, I don't like coming to work at eight. I don't wanna come to work at night. Uh, oh, that doesn't fit into our rules to be able to create an environment so that you can have this brilliance, and then of course the leader, that's what a job, that's what managers get paid for, to make the decision and to move forward. And I've been very fortunate from our background is that is what the legacy of Eula Packard had was creating these environments and the respect and that the individuals would be able to get the recognition and to be, I'm gonna give you an example in a, in a moment, to be able to uh, really have the opportunity to understand the marketplace, to be able to have ideas, to try ideas, and of course to fail. Because invention comes through failure. And this is the one concern that I do have is that we're becoming very, very metric driven. And again, for all of you with a finance background, you know, what's your return, uh, you gotta have a, return, show me what the payback is. I know Andy Grove said, what was Columbus's uh, return on invested capital and investing in America? You know, what did he tell the Queen of uh, Spain to buy what the review? You know, I mean, I mean, we don't, uh, you know, sometimes we get so analytical that it's very subtly that you can change this culture where you want to have this process going on, and it's an ugly process. People push and shove, and they, I can remember, they, oh God, what a stupid idea, and all the rest. And in fact, did you create that, make the decision, and move forward. The third part of this is all about commercialization. Great ideas, there are hundreds, thousands of them in Silicon Valley. You read about the winners, there are lots and lots of losers, and there's lots of opportunities when somebody had the idea and someone else commercialized it. So I'm gonna give you, a, uh, give you an example, then open up for some questions. Optical mouse, you guys all know what an optical mouse is? Everyone probably, everyone almost has an optical mouse. Pretty simple device, got a camera, takes, the top, uh, takes a picture of the top of your table, converts it into a signal and calculates the vector of where you're moving the mouse, right? Pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Who invented the optical mouse? Anyone know? Nope. <laughs> who invented the optical mouse? There's a guy in HP Agilent Labs who um, invented it, one guy. And uh, I was very good because I was running the uh, group. And what he said was, came up and said, you know, this trackball mouse thing's kind of dumb, you know, and kind of trackball's kind of old, you have a rubber ball running around. And God, you know, if you take a picture and you take a camera and take thousands of pictures a second of the top of a table, you can, uh, you know, you can convert this and make this thing pretty neat. And uh, I can remember that process. So it was a guy, had the idea, and uh, then I can remember a guy that came to me, and again, I can't remember what position I was, if I was a general manager, if I was a group manager, and they said, God, Bill, this is pretty neat stuff. And again, I was in the semiconductor, and we can make this thing a nice little small thing, and we'll just take out this trackball, shove this thing in, and we'll make this neat thing. Well, that sounds pretty good, pretty good. Um, whoops, who commercialized it? <laughs> Microsoft. Right? Here's Hewlett Packard, one of the largest companies in the world in computer. Microsoft was the first one to commercialize this product because the team that worked for me cut the deal with Microsoft to commercialize it. Bill Gates was standing there in one of their reviews and they had an optical mouse probably 10 feet high. All right? The optical, the trackball mouse in your computer, do you know how much that thing costs? $2.49. That's what HP said. So they come, so H and again, I'm not picking on HP, it's just an example, and you know, not any dirty laundry, and again, is you know, part of the whole, I'm part of it, obviously. $2.49, give me that optical mouse for $2.49. Well, you can't do that. It's, it's more technology, it's differential technology. In fact, it turned out the gamers love it because you get a lot more action on it. Yeah, not interesting, not $2.49. Do you know what uh, Microsoft introduced that mouse at? $80, first mouse went out at $80. Instantaneously, it's either half a billion, billion dollar market. Logitech quickly followed up, uh, went to the cordless mouse and all the rest. So you can see about a person, the leadership of making a decision and reaching out and figuring out how to commercialize. 
And the real silver lining in this, and again, you could argue that HP lost a half a billion dollar opportunity, but HP had an environment that allowed us, my team, to go cut a deal with Microsoft, right? So in itself, even though they made a decision, hindsight, bad decision, good decision, then the environment was there for us to be able to move on. I don't know where you find that. There's no process, there's no corporate development process that will do that. Uh, and there's endless examples of this. And you always read about the good stuff. I'm giving an example of kind of something good and something weird that happened. But it is about getting the right people in the environment and have the capability and flexibility to commercialize this idea. And I think that if Agilent is able to do that as focusing on measurement, that we can come out with better microarrays, that we can come out with better microfluidics to provide scientists tools to do drug discovery, to be able to find the tools, to be able to do a better job in terms of creating electronic mobile devices, that Agilent can take this value that we have created since we restructured and build a foundation for sustainable contribution uh, moving forward. So that's our story. Those are my two cents. You probably got a quarter's worth of input on what I think about innovation. And what I'd like to do now is stop and ask uh, and answer any questions or uh, welcome any comments. Thank you. Good news is, and my, my impression is, is that we got great people, and we're still in the environment where we attract the best in the world. I mean, during you weren't in the presentation this morning, I always ask how many international students, how many stay in the U.S., and not to get in a political debate, but from my position, we have always had the ability, because we have the best universities in the world, to attract the best and keep them here and not have them go back home, right? And so then it becomes, and again, it's a management problem. Many of you have ever studied uh, Deming. And Deming, again, is the father of quality. Uh, the US was a leader after World War II. And he, nobody wanted to listen to Deming about quality. The Japanese adopted it. And of course, that was part of the whole process of J Japan just doing a splendid job. And Deming used to say, all 90% of all company problems, all problems are management problems. And I always joke with all my employees that 99.9% .9 of all problems are the management problems, right? Is that, that the country has to restructure itself to be able to move into the future. I personally believe hanging on to the past uh, is, doesn't make sense. And uh, you know, from my viewpoint, I see the same thing in Europe. There's a tendency to hang on. The, it'd be almost like that we're in the 1900s worrying about that agriculture is going from 70% of our business to 3% where it is today, or one and a half. And today, manufacturing is going away. We are a service economy. We're an IP economy. And so we have to make that transition. The concern that I have through this whole process, ultimately, is can we get enough of our population educated enough to compete in that environment? Environment. Well, again, as you all know, and I mean, you guys are, you know, are the experts. Again, we have the highest college graduation in the world, but our education system, particularly at lower grades, is just a real big issue. And it's a big deal for Agile. And all of our money that we put in back into the community is focusing on education. And if we are not able to build the skill sets, and if we do not have the skill sets in Agile and in aggregate, uh, we will have enormous pressure. And what happens is, is that you get a divide. The middle class gets compromised. I don't believe, personally, that I'm, we're going to lose the high end or we're not going to find the brightest people to think of the next invention. But can you, in fact, have an infrastructure in place that's competitive enough to truly differentiate yourself? The good news is, is that things change. And I also use an analogy of Japan. I can remember when the emergence of Japan came. Great job. Uh, wow, what's going to happen? Now, Japan, the cost in Japan is the exact same as in the US. This, their standard of living had just rocketed. Problem is, is there's only 100 million people in Japan. You know, now we're talking about billions of people, so that process of equalization of salaries is going to take longer. But if there's any good news for you, it is happening rapidly. If you go along the coast of China, the salaries are just absolutely rocketing. You go into India, the salaries are rocketing. And this is all good news. It's the displacement through these decades that it's going to take, or two decades, because the number of 
people is what causes the problems. But I think that we have to continue to focus on reinvention. I think companies have to demand the education system is better. And I'm a firm believer it is about innovation. And if we go down a path of regulation, uh, we will not be happy in 30 or 40 years from now. Yeah. I've always used your general purpose instruments, and mm -hmm. me and a lot of people like me were kind of amazed how far you swung to the telecom side to the point where you could hardly find your standard instruments yeah. in the catalog. And yeah. You even dropped a lot of them. Um, right. It seemed like you had to retrench a bit, and I think companies like Fluke and Yokogawa probably sure. moved in on that market. Uh, you kind of hinted that you're going to swing toward the biotech now. Um, what's the commitment to your original instruments? Yeah, it's a great question, and let me go back. First of all, the commitment to our standard electronic instrumentation is 101%. So don't anyone leave this room thinking that we are not uh, are going to ignore that. Let me talk about, uh, from my perspective, what happened. I was part of that. At that time, I was running the component part of the whole telecom boom. You, you got caught up in the euphoria of the growth. And so you made a decision of saying, well, geez, this thing is going, and the internet was doubling every whatever number of days, which turned out was not true at all. And so all the resources got marshaled on this effort, and other very profitable markets, industries became neglected. And it was interesting, and then what happened when the crash came, then you have all this distraction to resize yourself moving forward. And so as a result of that, you open the door to your competitors uh, when you in fact have that singular focus on a bet that in hindsight is not a sustainable bet. And so what we are doing moving forward, and I'll give you an example of aerospace and defense. You talked about low, in, you know, the basics instruments. Aerospace and defense during that period of time um, you know, wasn't doing very well. So same thing, hey, aerospace and defense has slowed down. Guess what? The U.S. Army today, and it's a lousy reason, but it's the true, is one of the top 10 customers for Agile moving forward. Because all the electronic warfare, you need an enormous amount of instrumentation to be able to keep all of this equipment running and to be able to measure it. And so I think that is a lesson for our management team that having attack of a broad market and not being able to make sure that you have a balanced approach to this instrumentation market can get you in a lots and lots of trouble. And so what you're going to see moving forward a year from now, I believe we'll have the broadest line of general instrumentation at the lowest cost point anywhere in the industry and not compromise our high-end capability to be able to measure the most sophisticated radar systems in the world. And uh, I think that's part of the lessons, and there are many of these lessons you can go on and on that happened inside of Silicon Valley during the boom and the bust? That's a great question. But we are absolutely committed, and we're absolutely committed to the biotech uh, analytical market. Yeah. So one thing that resonated with me was the focus on ROI. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's gotten to the point where I've noticed it in my company as almost analysis paralysis. Um, what do you think is driving that, and what's the solution? In terms of, uh, of getting rid of some of that. Too low, low, too high. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, the return on invested capital is the best predictor for the valuation of the company. There's lots of debate on this, and there's a big study that was just done in McKinsey where a company that is able to return greater than your cost of capital will have long-term sustainable shareholder value. And the data is overwhelming. And so what we have done at the executive level, my metric and my pay is all based on are we able to have a return greater than the cost of capital. In our case, cost of capital is 15.5%. We've made a commitment to Wall Street and myself to the board of directors that Agilent will be 20% return on invested capital. If one is able to do that, um, one can do that. Then the devil's in the details, right? So you cannot cut yourself to 20% return on investment for long, right? I mean, eventually something's got to get done, right? And that is what's happening. And that's where it comes back to the growth and the innovation where the risk taking is. And so what I would submit is that if you have a business model that is inherently, because of the work that you have done, better than the cost of capital, it frees up enormous opportunities to create the environment and culture that I have. And the danger is, is that you've done so much work to get you to that point that somehow you're going to try to, uh, you can't even take a risk of an experiment because it doesn't tie back to this ROAC. It's ridiculous, right? I mean, Agilent spends $800 million a year, and I can tell you right now, a bunch of it 
may not ever get commercialized, that's okay, but you've got to be rigorous enough to say no. And actually what happens to big companies, again, I was an R&D manager, as I said, for a while. What happens is, is that management fails to move on. And uh, sometimes I used to joke, everybody and every engineer in the building knows this project should have been killed three years ago and everybody's still hoping. And all of you learned that sunk cost is sunk cost and once it's gone, it's gone. And everybody knows that, but it's against human nature. And uh, it's just amazing to me. And you look at the resources that come up. You got the stuff that you should have killed and then someone wants to try something and then you, you get caught in this uh, conflict. So that is the key in that environment and that's where leadership comes to, to be able to make sure the inventors are are separated from that. Yeah. So you're running a, a 26,000 person company based in Silicon Valley and you focus on innovation and you have a lot of innovation, especially in the biotech field that's coming up now, kind of from startup companies as they have in the tech field. How, how do you see Agile's relationship with startups? Well, first of all, it's incredibly important, and we have a multiple ways of interacting with, uh, with startups. The first part of it is, of course, the contact that we have of giving tools to startups. We love technology inflection points. When the opto boom started in 1999, it cost $120,000 for every startup in optics to get going because that's what they needed to test whatever they're making. So we love these inflection points. So the obvious engagement is be able to be there, the support and the tools and the post-sale and the post-sale effort. The second part is, is to have the engagement with them to understand what is going on and what are the needs in the future. Because to be a measurement company, you've got to have the tools theoretically ahead of when the need is. And so we do that through our Agilent Labs. We're one of the few companies left in the world that has a centralized research facility. They do that. And we also started four or five years ago our own venture fund. And it's called Agilent Venture. So what better way to understand what's going on inside of the high tech world, the startup world, is to be an owner. Right? I mean, where are they going to talk to us? Okay, you're going to buy equipment, but to really be an owner to be able to do that. And so we have an Agilent fund that we invest in uh, startup companies. And so between that, and then last, of course, is through acquisition. We uh, make a lot of what I call small, mid-sized acquisitions. We tended not to make huge acquisitions that you read about in the paper, but we just bought a company that does location analysis. It's been incredibly successful to continue to, uh, to work with some of our uh, bio. We just bought a company that does a very very low cost software for RF microwave uh, simulation design. And so, that, so that's what we will do. So we try to look at it. There is no cookbook, but it really is smart people looking at these options and then making uh, very rapid focused decisions. Yeah. Um, you, you said that innovation is a big part of Ashland. What is Ashland doing to protect uh, your intellectual property in other countries such as China, India, or Eastern Europe? Yeah, it's, uh, first of all, in terms of intellectual property, it's a big deal, particularly inside of uh, China and some parts of Eastern Europe. Actually, a lot of the code that gets broken that we have is actually out of Poland and Russia. It's quite interesting, some of the code being br broken. And so there's a couple parts of that. First of all is protecting your own intellectual property inside the company. And I can say I'm very, very happy. I mean, our culture is so strong. Our focus of 65 years of uncompromising integrity, we have not had a problem. We have a huge design center in Beijing. I'm going to be there on Monday, and there are no issues. Our folks are creating great intellectual property for the China market, and we protect that. Now there's the question of how do you protect your IP in the gray market or black market, and I think this is going to be a multi-year effort. I think that we often take for granted the 500 years of work of creating rule of law thanks to the British. India has that, we do, but it has been hundreds of years of developing this. And to say in China, all of a sudden tomorrow, I'm going to have a rule of law that after thousands of years that is non-existent, I think is not very realistic. And I think it's also pretty presumptuous on this, it's going to turn. I am absolutely convinced that with time, with growth of indigenous Chinese companies, it will change. Uh, Agilent is active with other uh, Western companies in China to start that whole process, support it, uh, but it's, it's going to take a while. And so some places, and people have it much very different, it's all in the software area, uh, have much different uh, strategies inside of China. And our strategy has been is to work with each of our customers and to explain that, you know, if you buy a software seat, 
that is one seat and not a hundred seats, right? And uh, and so and we've made some real progress to be able to to be able to make that happen. But it's going to be a while. I mean, I have no illusions this thing's going to be fixed tomorrow. The good news is for Agilent is that you know the intellectual property that we are creating in China, uh, creating uh, is uh, has been very well protected and I'm very pleased. Just an outstanding team. Yeah. That's a great question. I'll be real frank with you. We have a lot of room and opportunity inside of Agilent to do that. Many people that come to the company say, you have a candy store of technology. Now tell me exactly how you commercialize your strategic intent. And it goes back to the, to the people and the partnerships. Again, the example I use is a classic one where inside of a company, you couldn't get traction, but somebody had enough sense. And when you think about it, why would Microsoft want to get into the optical mouse business, right? Well, they had a guy over there that actually, I don't even realize, but Microsoft does about a half a billion dollars of hardware that they, that they do as a side. And so they made this relationship in, in that environment to make it happen. It is having people in an environment that can come up with common business models that are um, very, very successful. And uh, what we're going to, to do moving forward, particularly for us, and I'll give you another example where I think is just classic, is I've been back to Washington, D.C. more in the last two years than I've had in 30 years. Right, because I mean we're a West Coast company, and and you know Washington's its own creature, and uh, and some could say I come from a blue state or whatever. But anyway, but we but we come back from, uh, and you know so I go I go to Washington. They said, Bill, you guys have all this technology on the analytical side and on the uh, um, electronic side. Why don't you marry this together? These are the tools we need for homeland security. These are the tools that that uh, we need for the Department of Defense, and uh, that's a whole nother way of understanding how. How is money how is money spent? Who is the decision maker moving forward to take an idea and to commercialize it? And guess what? There are a bunch of people that live in the Beltway in Washington DC are very, very good in that. And so when you come from a technology, you come in, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I come from the labs, and I said, Bill, and I can't, I won't tell you what it is, but uh, you know, let's say it's in surveillance. We got a great idea, the world should buy this. And I said, it's a political process. Right, the government is a, there's nothing wrong, it's a political process. You have to understand that. And so that's why it's so important, and of course why you, know, you have MBAs and why that you have people with technical backgrounds. How do you create that business, unique business model that you can create value for the investment that you have? And I think that's just enormously, it's easy to copy somebody else, it's easy to just lower cost. How do you in fact take that and, and go through what it takes to be able to create that business model and then it's all about execution. about that because I think your observation is real and that's what large companies always struggle with and I think that that is a legacy that we have inherited from Hewlett Packard that really makes Agile unique. First of all, Hewlett Packard had a fundamental principle that the employee knew what they were doing. That employee that was empowered would do great things. Just a fundamental belief in people. Second thing, they believe that the decisions are best made at a decentralized position. As a result of that, if you go back over the decades, HP created these small business units, general managers, where you had small teams of people that were able to create great products and services. Agilent today is like that because this market is very, very fragmented. The problem comes in as you go into higher and higher integrated solutions. 
So let's say that Agilent goes into a factory. Instead of just selling equipment, we take over the whole test suite. We're going to do all the software. We're going to do all the development for you for the next generation of missile or whatever it is. Uh, it takes thousands of people to do that. There's a whole different management skill that comes to be able to make that happen. And typically what happens, it is about scale. It's about scalability. And I've always been a fan of watching companies. And companies get into trouble at $10 million, 50, 100, a billion. And you know all those case studies. They write endless case studies. is because the skill set from going to point A to point B is very, very difficult. And that's why they write books about Yule and Packard, because they're one of the few managers that were able to go from a startup with $500 and make the first oscillator for a Disney movie uh, to going into a multi-billion dollar. That is a very, very rare uh, phenomenon. So what you're saying is that it depends on the size of the problem. Scale, it's all about scalability. It's all about scale. It's the problem. And that's where uh, management runs into trouble because of the complexity moving forward. And I see it in Agile all the time. You see it in every big company. IBM actually, I think, of, of just a huge company in terms of managing scale across multiple functions of thousands of people actually do it uh, very, very well. Yeah. A lot of the business world has had a, a problem with integrity during the last few years. And I noticed that you mentioned that word many times. Yeah. And so I'm just curious about you know, what you think helps maintain that most effectively. Yeah, it's a great question, and again, I, I'm not going to make a joke before I answer your question. I never worry about going to jail. You know, I mean, given the culture that we have, and again, with 28,000 people, and I sign every quarter that the results that are printed that you read are absolutely right. And my excuse can't be that I didn't know about it, right? I signed that document. That's based on the new uh, SOX rules, right? Sarbanes-Oxley, that I have to sign that. And I'll tell you, it all starts at the top. You cannot ever tolerate any sort of conflict of integrity, none. And uh, you just can't, it's a cancer inside your company. Uh, a sales guy taking a client out to uh, you know, some dinner that you shouldn't be at, right? I mean, having some deal on the side where I'm gonna, hey, I'll buy you some golf clubs. Hey, I'm gonna look the other way with a procurement guy. Well, I'm gonna get a bid, but I'm not really gonna bid. You, you can't have any compromise of integrity. And when there is, you have to terminate people involved immediately. And it all starts on the top. I mean, I, I, I tell you, I mean, I, I mean, my expense accounts, I have my CFO use. <laughs> You know, we basically allow people $50 a day to, you know, to eat when they're traveling and whatnot. And uh, I tell you, I track it and make sure that I never spend over $50 because I have to set the example. And it's very, very subtle inside the company. I personally believe what happened is a classic story of greed. Uh, greed and power. And there's an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal that talked about this. And if you go back in history from the 29 crash and then oh, I guess even before that the railroad problems, it seems like every 20 years we have some huge scandal. It's almost like you have a new generation that somehow believe that the rules don't apply to them. And, uh, and once it starts, it, especially if it starts at the top, it goes right through the company. And, uh, you know, and I think any CEO in this country has to make an example. And if they don't do it, they deserve to be in jail. And I'll give another comment on SOX. Everybody complains about SOX and unfair is. I'll be one of the only CEOs in the top uh, the 500 companies in the U.S. It is absolutely the right thing to do. It is at putting process control and our ability to be able to manage the transactions in the company. The world is very complex. You know that. If you ship something today and part of it's software, how do you re recognize revenue? You know, when you're making boxes and widgets, it's easy to count, but you're selling services. How do you value that? How do you pay people? How do you accrue costs? And that having a robust, verifiable, verifiable process to make sure that it is under control, I think, is just as important as we worry about that who's ever building this computer works when you turn it on, right? And there's all kinds of process control to build this computer. Why aren't there process control to be able to manage the finances and the transactions inside of companies? So, uh, so again, I, I actually think it's been, a, it's been actually, it will be good long term for American industry. I think that's a great place to stop with a question from the provost and an answer that I'm Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.